So the dungeons were a special case in Breath of the Wild. For a game this huge, it had a surprisingly low number of only 4 sort of regular dungeons, looking away from the final dungeon. This low number probably is because the world is filled with shrines that kind of replace the standard dungeons. We call them sort of regular dungeons, because they step into this game as the dungeons that helps you progress with the main story. But instead of having caves, temples, or what we traditionally know as dungeons in the series, they come in the form of what they call divine beasts. Which we must admit was a unique concept. These are huge living robots, so to speak, that live and have been corrupted by Ganon, and you need to walk around inside this beast to solve puzzles in ways you would expect from a Zelda game. You get a three-dimensional map and different points you need to reach with your Sheikah Slate, and you get to control one or more parts of the beast to help you with puzzles, which is also a bit unusual. However, what these divine beasts sort of lack is a good enemy variety and distinction between themselves. So making this list was not very easy for us who often have hard times to rank things that often feel the same to us, like the early Game Boy Dungeons. Still, we gave it a shot and we tried our best to rank these, including the final dungeon. And we felt we needed to explain a little about what the general feeling about these new dungeons are here in the intro. Once again, please notice that all of these lists are made before any DLC came out, so no DLC content is included in these lists. We're the owners of Triforce, I'm on the one. And I'm on the two, and this is our Breath of the Wild dungeon ranking. Landing at the bottom is Divine Beast Vamedo. Jeez, these names. The flying bird above Rito Village. One thing we have to at least mention about these beasts, but didn't take too much into account, was how you got to enter each beast. They all usually have some sort of battle in order to enter. And with this one, you had to fly around with Tiba and firing bomb arrows at four cannons around it and removing the shield it has. It felt badass. The beast itself keeps gliding through the sky, and it feels pretty amazing to just be up here and enjoying the view of the world below, and how you need warm clothing to resist the cold up there. Atmospherically, it does pretty well that way. When it comes to puzzles and transportation, it's not unexpected that it uses a lot of wind, but it's also neat how the control of the beast itself allows it to slightly tilt it sideways. This helps blocks falling into places, huge objects pushing switches, and get monorails going among other things. It's a fine dungeon where you spend almost just as much time inside the bird as you do outside, either beneath its wings or even on top of it. This beast ranks last because it's pretty easy. Well, some things were decently challenging, like only one forgetting that you could control the beast in some way, even if you had done two beasts already. Hey! Sorry, but it's true. Either way, this beast did nothing bad, but one of these had to come in last. Next up is the big elephant in the pool, in Divine Beast Varuta. To enter this beast, you had to sit on Sidon's back, swim up the waterfalls coming from it with the Zora armor, to then shoot the orbs on its back. This also is a pretty cool way to enter the dungeon. The dungeon itself is pretty neat. It has a number of water and ice puzzles, which of course is fitting for a Zora dungeon in the game. The Cryonis ability is very helpful here and the way to control this beast is to raise and lower the elephant's trunk to have water falling onto the water wheels and also for some platforming on top of it. A lot of the puzzles revolve around those and gears to raise and lower a few platforms and to turn platforms around for it to stand horizontally, allowing you to walk onto them. Atmospherically, this might actually be one of the weaker ones. When standing outside, you don't see much more than mountain walls and the pool it stands in. It's not bad at all, but might just be weaker than the others. However, this beast is the only one that had music that I really noticed in the background. The other beasts just had music that never reached to me, personally. But this one just felt... eerie. I'm not sure if it's super fitting, but it had a melody that actually kinda creeped me out a bit. Or... I don't know how to explain it. I really did take notice to it, so I guess that's a good thing. This was the first beast I tackled, so it took me some time to finish it, but compared to later beasts, it wasn't all that tough. It was decent though, and that's why it lands the number 4 spot.
powering its way onto third place is Divine Beast Var Rudania. This one takes form of a salamander. At least we think it's a salamander. Fire and salamander seem to go hand in hand in Japan for some reason. But we might be wrong. And Rudania finds itself climbing around the active volcano of Death Mountain. The way to enter this dungeon might... just might be our least favorite. There's nothing downright bad here. But shooting the wimpy Yenobu at the Divine Beast, while funny, was for some reason not the coolest way. The sentries were sort of at times fun to avoid, but the whole thing went really slow and the music got pretty annoying after a while. Plus, I had to backtrack because I, um, did not know I had to shoot Yenobu at the beast from those cannons along the way. <clears throat> but yes, that's of course my fault. The beginning here was very interesting. We loved the darkness it presented to us once we got inside. This darkness is something we feel was underused in this dungeon, and even in the game in general. Once we got the map, everything was clear again, and we actually found that kind of disappointing, cause it was really exciting to go exploring in complete darkness, only carrying a torch with you. It also used puzzles with blue flames, which isn't really a big deal here, since it doesn't do a whole lot different from regular flames, but we... We really like blue flames. Atmospherically, one could argue that the surroundings of the beast doesn't offer too much of a view compared to Ruta, but there's just something about standing on a divine beast right in the middle of a burning hot volcano that makes this pretty cool. Of course you need some gear to defend yourself from the flames, but that's only when you are on the outside. The mechanic of this beast is to turn it on its side, like when it's climbing on a wall. This, of course, allows you to play with physics in order to solve different puzzles. So the beast has great atmosphere and awesome, although very underutilized, darkness and blue flames that we really enjoy, in addition to some standard but enjoyable fire puzzles. Hunching its way to second place is Divine Beast Van Boris, this giant camel walking around in a stormy cloud in the desert. It's an interesting choice, especially when you consider that while the bird had the wind, the salamander had fire, and the elephant had water, which all makes sense to us. This camel has the element of electricity for its puzzles and theme. Maybe it makes total sense in some cultural setting, but it's new to us. And don't get us wrong, there's nothing negative with that. This one is probably the most difficult in both the dungeon itself and the way to enter it. You go seal surfing with Riju and try to stop its movements by shooting at its feet with bomb arrows. However, its rampage shoots lightning all around and it's actually difficult to stay within Riju's shield at all times. Why we consider this one to be most difficult is because of its puzzles and... Well, it was the first one I went into so it was my first dungeon, making this divine beast concept all new to me by the time I got here. In addition, I was very tired from playing football earlier that day, so when it's not just about tilting the beast's position or raising a trunk, you spin around three different wheels inside of this beast, which made the puzzles about electricity and platforming in general pretty challenging. Spinning these wheels around to connect the electrical lines together while finding a way through was challenging and fun. It allowed you to use the electricity to raise its head as well, and doing the puzzles where you used magnesis and carried the little ball to the right places to connect the circuits, which is something we really enjoyed. This dungeon is great atmospherically as well. Of course, I admit that some of it might be biased since this was the first beast I tackled, especially in the way the beast sort of roars whenever I change the position of any of the circles, because every beast does that, but it was new to me then. However, the view from this thing is amazing as it just walks around in the desert in a circular pattern, allowing you to stand in the outdoor parts of it to just look over the beautiful landscapes of the desert. In addition, the music fits very well. I mentioned that the music in Ruta was very noticeable, because I really remember that one. However, hearing the theme inside the Boris again, I really think it fits. Hyrule 
castle. Now, hear us out. We're not placing this dungeon on top just because it was more of a regular dungeon rather than a divine beast. The final dungeon of this game was amazing to us. Just as soon as you enter the castle through the doors, or any other angle you could possibly imagine for that matter due to the openness of this game, you're hit with this grand music and feeling of reaching the big finale of this huge game. Well, we did anyway. It's so true about the music here. Not to speak very badly about it, but a lot of the music in this game hasn't been top notch to us. Sure, it's somewhat atmospheric, but after hearing sort of random piano cues so much out in the open field that you spend so much time in, and that damn stable theme so many times, it was super refreshing hearing this beautiful theme. It really set the atmosphere high for us from the first steps into this castle. The music changes for a more fitting mood when being inside the castle. This dungeon is also incredibly huge and just packed with enemies, which is welcomed by us, as the divine beasts were sort of lacking in that area. The place is overflown with different kinds of guardians, and has a ton of enemies you're used to from the wild, so there's a big challenge here. Different kinds of little foes, moblins, even mini-bosses like a stone talus and a stall hynox that guards the highland shield. However, there is a pretty straight line up to the boss, and that road is very challenging to take, with the different guardians keeping an eye on you, and the lionels that'll take you on in these small gatehouses. But since this game is so open, you can even climb your way past a lot of the enemies and make a safer route to the final boss, which is somewhat cool, but also sad, because there is a lot to miss out on. You see, this isn't just Hyrule Castle as a dungeon. This is actually Hyrule Castle. It really feels like the home of the king and the princess as you get to enter their dining hall, their library, the lockup, a dock inside a cave, the king's secret study, and even Zelda's room and the many many hallways that are inside this place. There's tons to explore as there are even Koroks to be found here, and the castle contains its own freaking shrine as well. Seriously, it took me over three hours to explore this place, as I tried to check out every corner and walkable surface to see what kinds of treasures and hidden rooms I could find. Needless to say, it was almost overwhelming to check through it all. But it's amazing just how much they put into this place, and you should not miss out. Hyrule Castle was definitely a high point for us in this game, and so much bigger than I expected. We could easily agree that this dungeon had to land the number one spot on our dungeon ranking. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.